this is it. In just a matter of moments, I am going to be gone. There's, there's no way I'm going to get out of this. They exist. This thing was massive. Okay, so here's the setup. I am in the Virginia range of northern Nevada. Virginia City is that way. And I'm going to be spending the night up here below this mountain behind me up in these trees here and I'm going to be making some dinner got a New York steak looking forward to that and a beer of course and we also have a story this is one of the most dramatic stories I've ever come across this is from one of our viewers really became a literally a life or death situation and really dramatic. I've never heard a story like this before. We're going to be telling that story and also we have an interview after that. All right, let's get to it. So here is my setup, and I think if we had to, we could do the story from inside the tent here. That would probably work. It is really windy out. But fortunately, I am snug as a bug in a rug here, so we're gonna be okay. And for tonight's beer, we have Leave No Trace by the Great Basin Brewing Company. And that is a Alpine Lager. Let's see if I can open this without it exploding on. Oh! <laughs> this has been rattling around in my backpack for a while, so there we go. Oh my gosh. There we go. But we're going to be just fine. That is an enjoyable beer, and I like their uh, can here. Look at this, it's got a yellowish orange tent, just like I got in the mountains there. <laughs> if you're going to drink a beer with a tent on it, you better drink it in the tent, even if you make a mess. Cheers. Got a piece of bark. <laughs> That's how it is out here. It is a really good beer. Very smooth. Very smooth. So this story came to me from one of our viewers. His name is Bill. He currently lives in Toledo, Ohio. He grew up there. And he grew up enjoying the outdoors. Bill is currently 64, so he's a little bit older than I am, but he, we grew up in the same era, so to speak. And he grew up in Toledo, and near where he lived in Toledo, maybe just outside of town, there was a state preserve that had forests and, and a marsh and all kinds of places to explore, and he grew up trapping there, hunting, fishing and camping in that area in Ohio. And back in 1976, he got an opportunity to go to Arkansas to see his aunt. And his aunt needed some help with her place while she was going to go have some surgery done. And his sister was going to take his aunt to the surgery. And so he thought this would be a great opportunity to go check out Arkansas. And his aunt has 50 acres of property in rural Arkansas near Mena, Arkansas, which this property was adjacent to the Washita 
National Forest. 1.8 million acres of forest. So Bill arrives in Arkansas and he's looking for his aunt's place and he actually got lost. He said, Chris, she lived way out in the boonies. He finally gets there, finds her place. She's got a mobile home on this 50 acres of property. Really happy to see her. And she proceeds to show him around a good part of this 50 acres, just to give him an idea of the property. And he's really excited. And she leaves the next day. So he's in charge now. And he takes care of the animals, waters some plants, takes care of the cat and the dog, and does this for another day. Same thing on the next day, which was March 7th. And then March 8th came, and that was his big day to get up early, just take care of a few things, and then go and explore. Go out beyond the 50 acres into the Washita National Forest. So he was so excited, he said he slept about four hours that night. He got up about 5.30, got everything ready, took care of the animals. He had the whole day to himself, about six o'clock. He got his pack ready, compass, food, snacks, water, and he had a colt python that his father and his brother gave him as a birthday present. It was his 17th birthday, 1976. He heads out, goes through the 50 acres, and just loving it, just loving this new adventure and this new location, totally different feel in the forest there. And he comes to this kind of an opening and he can see this ridge, big, huge mountainous ridge in the Washita Mountains. And he decides to climb up it and just to check it out, just get a good view of the area. Working his way to the top and about two thirds of the way up, he hears this noise and it sounds like traffic machines or cars or something. He gets to the top, walks over and he looks down the other side from the ridge into this valley and he can see a logging crew with their machinery and trucks and people and they're working down there. And he's looking at this for a minute and then he takes a couple steps back and he looks to his right and he looks up and he sees in the crotch of this tree, about seven, eight feet up in the air, a dead deer laying there draped over the tree. And he's looking at this like, what in the world? How did that get up there? That's crazy. He climbed up the tree, reached up and he could touch the deer and he felt that it was cold. Right then he noticed that the neck of the deer was twisted like six times around. And he thought, what could have done that? That's crazy, a mountain lion would not do that. And he steps back and he's looking at that. Really strange, really odd, very chilling to see this dead animal that high up in a tree, white-tailed deer buck. He looks back down at the job site. He decides he's gonna hike down this slope and go talk to these guys and just say hi and check out the situation down there. And as he's coming down the slope, one of the guys stops and starts staring at him, just staring right at him. And he thought, that's a little odd. And then next thing he knew, there was three, four guys standing there in this job site, just staring at him. And he said, well, I'm just gonna walk up. And he finally gets there and he walks right up to him. He says, hi, my name's Bill, how are you guys? And they said, what are you doing back here? And he said, oh, I'm just hiking. I'm really enjoying the day. It's a great area. I love it. And they said, are you from around here? And he said, no, I, I'm, I'm at visiting my aunt's place, and she lives on the other side of the ridge here, and I'm just out for a hike. And then they said, have you ever been in this forest before? And he said, no, no, sir, not at all. But uh, I really like it. And then he said, why are you guys giving me the third degree? And they all looked at each other and they looked back at him and they said, come on over here, we wanna show you something. 
and they brought him through the job site. There was this large piece of equipment, like a skitter. They pointed to and they said, see this fan belt here? And the, he had a really huge fan belt. The logger said someone or something came in recently and just ripped this out of our machine just and broke it. And he said, we have had this happen three times and these belts cost like $300. And he was like, wow, what could have done that? That's it had to be massive to break this thing off. I mean, you could hook a chain to a truck and pull it off or something. And they said, yeah, we don't know what happened, but, you know, some kind of vandalism or who knows what. Just then, this white pickup truck pulls up and it's the foreman on the job site. He steps out and he says, hi, how's it going? And, and they kind of were talking about the situation and... He said, I don't know if the guys told you this, but we had a deer yesterday walk into our job site and it was injured. In fact, it was so injured that the foreman took the rifle out of the pickup truck and dispatched the deer. Had to kill it. And Bill said, wow, that's really interesting. What kind of what kind of deer was it? And they said, it was a, a buck, white tail. And he goes, that's really interesting because I just came off of this ridge behind us here and I found a white tail buck up in a tree about eight feet high in the crotch of a tree, just resting there, like somebody put it there. And they said, you're kidding me. How far away is this? And he said, oh, just 15, 20 minutes back up the ridge, right at the top there. He said, can you take us up there? And he said, sure. And so they made the hike up there, finally get there. Sure enough, the deer is still in the tree. Right away, the foreman said, that's the deer. That's the exact same deer that we had down here yesterday. And the foreman said, I don't think we told you this, but once we dispatched this deer, we drug it out into the grass about 40, 50 feet because I was going to take it home at the end of the day and use the meat. And the end of the day came and that deer was gone. Same deer, it's gone. And they're like, so we don't know how it got up here. This is crazy because I can't imagine, again, a mountain lion dragging it half a mile up a steep ridge, putting it up into a tree. And right then, they heard this deep, low growl. And they couldn't pinpoint where it was coming from. There was forest all around them. They're standing there at the base of this tree with this deer in it, and there was three of the loggers and Bill and they were hearing this growl and this growl went on and on and on for at least 20 seconds and very intimidating and they could not see where it was coming from and the foreman noticed the Colt Python 357 on Bill's hip and he said have you used that thing before? Like, have you killed an animal before with that? And Bill said, no, I have not. But Bill said, I do know how to use it. And the foreman said, okay, that's what I was looking for. I think it's best we get out of here now. And so all of them just worked their way right back down the ridge and got back to the job site. And Bill's kind of hanging out there for a little bit. And one of the guys comes up to him and he says, hey, if you want to just wait here for a few more hours, at the end of the day, we can drive you on out of this forest here and get you back to where you came from, save you from hiking over. And Bill thought about it. He said, well, I should be okay. I got my compass. I know where I came from. I got plenty of water. Just got to go back that way. He says, okay, all right. And then another guy came, said kind of a similar thing. He said, we can give you a ride out. And Bill said, no, I think I'll, I'll just, I'm going to think I could follow this 
road here and the guy said well the road is about nine miles this way on this road and about 12 on that way and Bill didn't realize how far he had walked back there and then the guy said you know if it were me I'd take the ride out in fact you wouldn't catch me back here and Bill said well why is that and the, the logger worker said well, I don't know if you knew this, but there was three other job crews that turned this job down at this location. They didn't want to take it. We don't know why. We just, we just found that as being really odd. You know, maybe they were too busy. Maybe it didn't fit in their schedule. Maybe it didn't pay enough. We don't know. We were the fourth crew and we, we were the only ones that took the job. And we are from outside this area. We're from about 160 miles away. And Bill thought, wow, that's odd. I wonder, <laughs> wonder what they knew that this crew didn't. And it just felt really odd, but Bill still felt confident that, yeah, I could just go over where I came and work my way back just how I got here. The guy said, okay, okay. And so Bill left and he saw there was enough daylight and he started hiking on this dirt road and these roads, these logging roads, they literally, they just cut them right through the sides of these ridges and mountains even. And so it's level road and then it drops off and then it's really steep on this side. And Bill's working his way up this road and he gets to this point where it, the bend in the road kind of continues and it levels out and he notices he sees these large about 20 30 foot long logs maybe this round stacked 15 17 feet high just a big stack of them and then there was another stack on the other side so bill sets his backpack down right in the side road there, right in the middle. And he walks over to this log pile and he looks at it and he decides, I'm gonna climb up this thing. I'm really curious about how these logs are being held up behind because it's very steep down below and steep up above and these logs are just like sitting there. And he's hiking up this log pile, kind of climbing up it and he hears that growl again but this time it's louder and it totally startles him. And he's thinking, is that a mountain lion or a bear? He has no idea where it is. And he gets to the top and then he hears this like snapping sound, like this, like a branch break or something, like something's moving. And he's like, uh-oh, this is getting a little scary up here. He looks down the backside of this log pile and he sees three trees are holding the log pile up but two of the trees are completely broken off and the third one is broke and just like hanging there and this is the only thing holding this log pile up and he realizes that and he realizes he's in danger now not to mention hearing this growling sound immediately starts moving across the top of this log pile to get to the other side because he wants to avoid this growling sound and he hears another snap sound like this log pile is going to go at any minute and right then he hears this sound couldn't figure out exactly where it was but it was this almost like a dialogue of an animalistic like dialogue but it was he said it was like when you take a cassette tape and you put it in fast and it goes like that this sound like this weird talking sound unintelligible and he hears that just for a moment, and then he hears the log starting to move. He immediately reaches down, grabs his 357, clicks the hammer down so it doesn't cause any problems, and he throws it to the front of the pile. Right then, the log pile gave away, and he's just rolling with these logs down to the parking area where he was. When everything stopped, he's laying on his back covered in this pile of logs absolutely frightening he had a log across his chest and it was restricting his breathing 
He had two more that were like this and over like this. It created like this window and he could see up into the sky and he's got what felt like a broken ankle, broken ribs, broken wrist, punctured lung. He's bleeding, his shoulder's bleeding. Absolute terrible situation. His mouth is filling up with blood. And to breathe, he has to turn his head to the side and spit the blood out so he can continue to breathe. And he's trying his best to breathe through his nose, but the log that's on his chest is so heavy, it's just, he's being crushed. He's literally being crushed and he's laying there. There's nobody around. He's all by himself and he's thinking, this is it. In just a matter of moments, I am going to be gone. There's, there's no way I'm going to get out of this. Right then he heard what he thought was loggers walking up. He heard something walking up to where he was. And then he heard that sound again, that fast forward sound. And that's what he described it as, like a fast forward sound. And he's looking through this opening of this tree and then he saw it. This monster, absolutely massive monster looking down at him. It had a man-like face and the scar that ran from his forehead across his cheek and across his lips like that. This massive scar, cinnamon colored, massive hands, and it was about three feet away, just looking at him and his head kind of going back and forth like this. And he can't scream, he can't yell, there's nothing he can do. And he was so terrified that he started, his mind just started like shutting down because it couldn't deal with this reality that he was experiencing. And then he hears this rubbing, like sliding sound and this creature pulled off the top log and kind of flipped it down the slope and it rolled down the slope. Then he saw these two massive hands reach in and grab the second log and pick it up and flip it over again and that you could hear it roll and kind of go down the slope again. And this creature is like just a few feet away, just looking at him. And he sees these massive hands come down and grab the third log that's on his chest. And it picks it up and it makes this really loud grunt sound because it's so heavy. And he said this log was about as round as a basketball. Takes this log, he's not lifting it up, but he's getting it upright and he rolls it down. He can hear it roll down the hill. And then he said, Chris, at this moment, I could breathe again. I was absolutely terrified, but the pressure was off and I could breathe. And then right then he hears this pickup truck pull up. Just crazy story. This pickup truck pulls up. He, all he can do is he can just hear it. He can't see anything because he's laying on his back still. He's looking straight up. And this creature had turned and left and went back down the slope to the right. And this pickup truck was this way to the left. And he heard one of the loggers come walking around, looking around. And they were saying, hey, where are you? Where are you? And they were looking for him. And then he, he heard him yell to the guy that was still in the truck. It sounded like there was two guys. And then he said, we got a slider here. And he could hear him kind of walking up the logs and looking around and kind of checking out because they all kind of everything's kind of settled out. And then he said, oh my God, oh my God. And he could hear him running and he could hear him saying, go, go, go. And then he heard the pickup truck drive away. And he's laying there going, oh my God, they just left me here. And it, and he thought maybe did this man, this logger see this creature that I had just seen moments earlier? 
And then he laid there and within about three or four minutes, he heard a couple pickup trucks pull up and they're yelling, looking for him. And then they found him. And it was the man, the foreman, it was the foreman and they got him into the pickup truck and brought him down the mountain and got him to the hospital where he made it. He lived. And he told me, he said, Chris, had those loggers come first before this creature came, I would not be here today. I would not have made it because they would not have been able to get that equipment up there that they needed to move these logs. There was no way they could pick these logs up. There's no way. And he said, turns out it was, it would take at least two, three hours by the time they got this skidder onto a trailer and drove it up and got it off and brought it over. And he said, I would not have made it. And Bill said, he's so grateful that he survived this, but there was a cost to him to live through this. And in fact, he said he's got, to this day, he deals with PTSD, night terrors, nightmares, and sleep disorders. It's really hard for him to sleep at night. And he said, I was, I'm kind of stuck in this moment where this creature was moving these logs and I didn't know its intentions. I didn't know if it was going to kill me. And that's what his nightmare is, is he doesn't know what this creature is going to do. And he's grateful that he survived and, and this thing rescued his life, but it's been so hard to deal with all of this. And the reality of a thing like a Sasquatch is just crazy. And to see one that close. So Bill said he's improving, he's getting better, he's getting a lot more help. It's been a long haul, but he's reaching out to people and talking about it, talking to people like me and others. And he wants to enjoy his life and get back and then even enjoy nature at some level. And he really feels like he's getting better and he's going to get better. He's going to make it. And I just really encouraged him to do so as well. So. All right, that is our story for tonight. The wind seemed to have died down. It is, it's still nice and cozy in the tent here. It's kind of fun to be <laughs> outside, but I'm inside while I'm doing my video. Cause usually I'm just sitting in the forest somewhere <laughs> or on a mountaintop or in the snowbank. <laughs> Who sits in the forest and drinks beer? <laughs> Gets paid for it. <laughs> Me. So this happened in 1976, is that correct? 1976, March 8th. Wow, March 8th, wow. And you yeah. were in Arkansas? I was in just outside of Mina, Arkansas at my Aunt Ina's uh, property uh -huh. that uh, she had uh, purchased there uh, with my uncle some 15 years before. Hmm. Uh, and... Uh, my uncle had passed away, and what had happened was uh, my aunt was leaving to go to Little Rock for uh, hip surgery. And I think, if I'm not badly mistaken, I believe she was having both of them worked on. And my sister Cookie, who's four years older than me, was going to go. Because she needed somebody, she asked if somebody would come and basically look out for the property, feed her animals, and take care of things. Would it be possible? So I heard my parents talking to my older sister and I, I butted right in because I, I had time on my hands, free time, so forth and so on. And I was really anxious mm -hmm. to go because I knew where her property was located. And uh, it was butted right up against the Washita National Forest there. I call it, a lot of people call it Washita. I call it Washita. Washita. Is that the correct way yeah. to say that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, people pronounce it differently. I've heard it okay. like five different ways now, but it's one point. <laughs> five different ways. One, yeah, it's one point eight million acres. Yeah. Uh, 
and it's a it's a big interesting place and i thought boy that'd be a oh boy that'd be a time and a half for me so i was under the assumption i was going to go with my older sister and the day before i find out well you can just if you'd like you can go on your own you know yeah. and i saw oh, well what an adventure this is going to be so i packed up just about everything i could think of that i would need and you know away i went and uh i got there and i got lost of course because she's about seven miles away from Mina in the boonies. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I finally found her location. And she had like a modular home, and they had, she had 50 acres. And, uh, wow. you know, she, she had, you know, she had, uh, she had a dog. She had two cats. Uh, she had three goats. She had chickens. She had ducks. And I, I, you know, it just went on and on and on. And, you know, it was yeah. just a, you know, it was a great place to be for me. I mean, I was just out, shoot, I was on top of the world. And uh, so we had talks, spent time together, had dinner together, and she took me out and we walked around her property. And I thought, oh, my, this is just, this is my place here. Because where I was raised uh, in Toledo, I was raised in North Toledo, uh out near an area called Point Place, which is near the Michigan line. And we had two huge areas of wetlands right next to where I lived. Mm -hmm. And so my whole life growing up, I, at a very young age, I was trapping. You know, I learned to trap. Uh, mm -hmm. and, I made money, and I made money off trapping. And uh, it was just hunting and fishing and being outdoors. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was my life. And I just, I I'm actually growing up, my entire life was down in those marshes and those wetlands. You know, basically, we was just, we was basically brought up in the woods, you know, sure. and that's, and, and that's where I felt at home. My dad had, growing up, had three boats. Uh, we spent dozens and dozens of uh, trips out at Lake Erie fishing. You know, I mean, it was just the whole outdoors was my world. So I just felt, you know, this was a adventure for me because I really got to be uh, there at my aunt's end. I got to be Mr. Responsible and take care of everything. I was only, you know, I was just coming up on 17 years old. Yeah. But even though at that age, I, I was pretty well responsible, you know, and I had been trained as far as, you know, with uh, when it comes to hunting, gun safety and you know, rigorous, rig, rigorously when I was young. Uh, so, uh, you know, we just did everything in the woods. And so my aunt left on March, the uh, the afternoon of March 6th. She heads for Little Rock, and I get out, and I'm just basically getting used to her area right there, her place, her property. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I was checking everything out, and the seventh came and went. It was a pretty, you know, I was outside 90%. I slept, I think the first night I was there, I only slept like four hours. I was so excited. Uh, and then the big day came, which was my birthday, March 8th. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got up on March 8th, I decided that I was taken off for that day. I was going to feed the animals, and I was taken off into the forest. So uh, with the stuff I brought, with what she had there, I got myself, it was a, uh, like a backpack, and I had uh, snacks, I had water, I had my compass, and I also had my birthday present that was given to me early, which was a 357 Mac, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a, a, a gift from my dad and my brother. And uh, I had told him I always wanted, it was a Colt Python, and I had always wanted something like that you know what i mean and so i was you know i was very careful with it i strapped it on and had my backpack and everything i needed and got up that morning it was right around six fifteen, six. no probably about five thirty. uh about six o'clock had everything well underway had coffee made filled my thermos fed the animals did everything Six thirty, i'm on my way into the forest got it now i head into the forest and i'm making uh, I also, when I was young, I was diagnosed as being manic, so I was always accident prone. I had hurt myself pretty badly several times, wound up in the ER, because I always did things five times faster than everybody else. 
And so I got out there and I'm excited and man, I'm just moving. I'm, I mean, I'm making my way through that forest and uh, just, oh, I'm, I'm so excited. And it was a day that was, uh, uh, I believe it was like in the fifties, high fifties, low sixties. And it had a light rain and it stopped and light rain and it stopped. It didn't bother me too much. I just kept going around. 10.30 or so, going on eight, between 10.30 and 11, I noticed I'm in the wrong part of the forest because I haven't seen no animals, you know. I, I haven't seen anything. I, I thought, well, you know, I'm bound to. I mean, you know, being out here in the middle of no man's land, I mean, it was just beautiful back in those, back in that forest. It was just spectacular. And, um, but I hadn't seen no animals and Anyway, I went on my track, and I just kept moving along. And about 12, 12, 15, something like that, I make my way to this area where I see there's a very high ridge, and I start heading up it. And over the next half hour or so, I make my way up, I'm doing, making pretty good time. About another 10 minutes, I get to the top of the ridge, and, um, and I had heard noise as I was going up this mountain. I had heard this noise, and I'm thinking to myself, that doesn't sound right. There's not a highway back there. Something was strange, and I got up there, and when I got up there, I realized what it was. There was a logging crew working. Oh. So I had seen where they were located, and they had been contracted to move about uh, something like 40, 50 acres of timber. Uh, somebody was back in there at some point. I forget exactly what it was, but there was a fire. And they cleared everything out of there and then replanted it. That was their job. That's why they were there. Yeah. And uh, But I'm up there at the top of the ridge, and I'm looking down, and they're about, oh, I'd say close to a half a mile away from me. And I look, and I step back because there is a deer laying in the crotch of a tree, and it's a buck. Really? And this thing, yeah, this thing's like seven, eight foot up. And since really? it's in the crotch of a tree and I'm thinking whoa I said who, yeah. who who could have shot this thing maybe they couldn't haul it out of here and they didn't want it to be scavenged or bothered by other animals so they put it up in this tree but wait a minute how'd they get it up that high and I'm asking yeah. myself all these questions and I walk up there and look and God is my witness it looked like this deer's head was twisted around like six times oh my gosh and I'm thinking, that was kind of strange, very strange to me. I had been deer hunting many times. I had shot several deer, bow hunting, and with a, a rifle. Uh hadn't quite experienced anything like that. And uh, and uh, I put my hand, I climbed up, reached up, and I put my hand just below the neck of the deer. And it was cold. Mm -hmm. So mm. so it had been there a while. And I thought, man, that is, you know, that's just plain strange. Yeah, very I, strange. Yeah, so I climbed down, and I, I decided, you know what, I'm going to head down towards the crew, the, the, the logging crew there, you know. So I start making my way down, and I realize as I get within maybe a football field where they're working, one guy looks, and he must have called out to the other guys there. Now i got three or four guys looking at me. Hmm. And, and they don't look too happy. <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, what's going on here? And I make my way down there, and they, hey, you know, I said, hi, how you doing? You know, I'm Bill, and this, you know, and the gentleman walks up and says, yeah, he says, uh, you mind if I ask what you're doing back here? I said, I'm just going for a hike. I'm, I'm out on a day hike. He said, you live around here? I said, no, I'm staying at my aunt's place, uh, you know, uh, and I basically explained to him where that was. And he says, you've never been back here before? You've been back in this area before? I said, I've never been back here. I said, I've never been in this forest. He says, oh. I said, you know, you mind if I ask why you're at giving me the third degree? Yeah. He, he says, well, you know, walk over here. I walked over and they had a piece of equipment there. They had these four belts, these very big fan belts. I mean, huge, right? These yeah. things, they, one was broke completely off. It had to be 10 foot long, maybe 12. But they were huge. They were, they were as big around as a half a dollar. Something had ripped these belts, 
off this piece of equipment. Mm. And they had found it that morning when they got there. And uh, mm. they was oh, they to buy suspected it. you possibly. Well, they suspected somebody of vandalizing yeah. their equipment. Yeah, yeah. And I said, you know, and I looked at them. Now, I had experience with a chipper, a big commercial chipper, which also had three large belts, small compared to these these gentlemen we're working with. And I said, how would somebody tear those belts the way they were ripped off? How would they do that? And they said, you know, we was asking ourselves the same question. It's almost like they'd have to hook a chain around it and have a back go and take off to tear them off the way they're positioned and the way they're on there. He said, but these belts are $300 a piece, you know, and uh, there's four of them. That's $1,200 plus. We're down because we can't own the piece of equipment. And so we're talking. Meanwhile, the gentleman pulls up in a white uh, Ford pickup truck. Now, I believe his name was Dale. He was the foreman. And I had learned just before he got there the day before, the day before that, when they were back there working, there was an injured deer that came in, walked mm-hmm. in right into the site where they were, yeah. and it was injured, and it was mm-hmm. bleeding. And Dale has a rifle in his truck, and he dispatched it. Mm-hmm. And I had asked him, well, what was it? Was the doe? Was a buck? Oh, it was a buck. The sitting you thing. He said, the reason, you know, and, and we're talking, he said, but, you know, it didn't last too long because somebody took it. And I said, well, somebody took the buck? He said, yeah. I said, well, you know, it's kind of funny. I just came from that ridge up there, and there's a buck up there in the crotch of a tree. He said, what? Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, there's one up there in the crotch of a tree. He said, how far up? I said, it takes about 15 minutes, you know, a moving to get up there, 20 minutes. But, you know, we I can take you there and show it to you. He said, like, you know, I'd appreciate that. So... Him and two of his guys and me start heading back up there. Yeah. We we get back up there and he look and they look at each other. That's the deer. That's the deer. Oh, so, it's the same deer. They had probably identified the, the antlers it's or the something. Same, or, right. It's yeah. the same deer. He, he looked where he shot it, the whole nine yards. He's thinking, uh, how? They're looking, scratching their heads like, how in the hell? Because actually what had happened was it was probably... 40, 50 yards from where their equipment was, back where they parked their vehicles, that's where the deer was. At the end of the day, the deer was gone. Got it. So they're, yeah. you know, they're all like, you got to be kidding me. You know, did a mountain lion come along dragging away? Did this happen? Did that, you know, they're scared. They can't figure it out. But he verified that was the deer. Hmm. And I told him, you know, I said, it's, it's sure cold. It's been dead a while. He says, they're all looking like, look at its neck. Look at its neck, you know. Mm-hmm. I said, you know, I thought the same thing. And just as we're talking, there was a sound. And I'm telling you, I couldn't tell where it was coming from, and neither could they. But I felt it. And I ain't never experienced nothing like that before in my life. And they all looked. Mm-hmm. The sound was the sound like the sound was like a low tone growl. But you know what you know what was unique about it? It lasted for twenty seconds. And we noticed it just a few seconds after it started and it went on and on and on. And we're looking and we're looking around. You know, and I'm thinking, well, and I, you could feel it. You could literally, I could literally feel it. And Dale, the foreman says, I felt it as well. He said, it might be best we get out, out of here. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, he had asked me, it was kind of unique. He had asked me, he said, there, you use that thing on your side there much, your side arm much? I said, you know, no, I haven't used it much at all. You know, I know how to use it. He said, that's, that, that's the answer I was looking for. Let's go. So we headed on out of there. So we head back down to the work area. And he had brought the belts, and the men went to work putting the belts back on it. And there was another worker that came up and said, if you want, you can hang out here for a while. When we get ready, you know, you can ride out with us. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I, you know, I I had planned a day hike. It's actually my birthday. Oh, happy birthday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, 
you know, I said, but, but I appreciate that. But, I, you know, I think I'm going to hike back out. And by doing so, I might be able to save some time because I'll take the road. I'll take the logging road. He said, well, depending on which way you go, because it splits off about halfway down. And if you go this way, it's like nine miles. And if you go this way, it's like 12 miles. And I'm thinking, I'm that far away? Yeah. And I had covered, that's how much ground I had covered. I was back in there quite a ways. Well, the one gentleman came up, and I was there for about another 15, 20 minutes, and we were just talking about equipment and the deer and just everything in general. And he said, you know, I, I'd wait here. And I said, why? He said, you might just be better off waiting here. You know, and I thought that, I said, well, you know, I, I think I found my way back. I know which direction I'm going. I got my compass. I got a pretty good idea which way I came through and up over the mountain there. And he said, well, you know, it's up to you, you know, but uh, if it was me, you wouldn't even catch me back here. And I asked him, why is that? He said, you know how many crews turned this job down before we got back here? I said, no. He said, three. We come from 160, we come from 160 miles away to do this job. I said, and why is that? He said, well, maybe the job was too small. Maybe he didn't pay enough. Who knows? Maybe they were too busy. He said, it was, we just find that extremely odd. And yeah. so I said, well, I said, yeah, that, you know, that is kind of strange. So, I said, but thanks for everything, and uh, I'm going to make my way on down the road. It was nice talking to you gentlemen, and uh, I'm going to make my way out. And I said, okay, be safe. Nice talking to you. So I yeah. got up and proceeded, grabbed my pack, and proceeded to head down the logging road. Now, as I'm heading down this logging road from the work area, the road has been cut into the mountain, okay? Yeah. Everything to my left you got to climb, and everything to the right, anywhere from 9, 10 feet to 12, 14 feet, is a drop, and it's 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 steep, my friend. Hmm. And so I'm heading down the logging road, heading back, and about following this road probably about another half hour, making good time trekking down the logging road, I noticed a piece of equipment sitting there. And to the right, there's a very unique area that goes out that's kind of level. And it's rounded off and it comes back. And they have a mountain of cut timber stacked there. And they got what they call a skid, a skidder there, or I forget what it is, but it's for picking up logs, loading them on the trucks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these these trees, they're like... I'd say 20 to 30 feet, and there's a stack on the right, and there's a stack on the left, and they're stacked about 15, 17, 18 feet high. And they go back 60 feet. Hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, right? I'm thinking to myself, what did they put as a backstop? You know, I mean, they, they, you know, they had to have something back there. These trees would just roll right down the hill, you know. Yeah. So I took my pack off, which was might have saved my life, and I laid it on the ground. I had my sidearm on me, and I had a bottle of water, and I went to climbing up this stack of timber. And oh. I was kind of excited to be truthful with you. And uh, I make my way up to the top. Get up there. It wasn't hard getting up there whatsoever. And I begin to walk to the back. And as I do, I hear this growling noise. In, but it's a little louder this time. Shorter. Caught my attention. I'm thinking, okay, you know, is this a mountain lion? Is this a bear? You know, okay, stay sharp. You know, stay sharp. So I get up there and I'm making my way across and I'm, as I get up to the top, I move to the right side, the right stack of the timber, and I'm making my way back. And as I'm making my way back, I hear a branch snap, and I mean it snapped loud. I removed my sidearm, added it in my hand, and I continued to walk back. There was probably another 15 feet. And I got back within five feet of the very back. 
and there was three trees there, Chris, mm-hmm. that had grown up that they was using for a backstop that caught all those timbers. And all three of them were snapped off, broken off. Oh, wow. One was almost ripped out of the ground. The other two were, like, broken within a foot or two of the ground. And you can see where the ground gives way. And I'm thinking, what would have caused that? And then it hit me. There's nothing holding this timber. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's there's enough holding the first three, four, five feet of it, but if anything above it decides to whatever, this is a dangerous place to be. I hear a snap again. As I do, I'm moving backwards. I'm moving backwards now. I'm moving to the other side of the cut timber, the whole other side, which is probably 30, 35 feet across, 40 feet. I'm moving all the way to the other side. I don't want to be near where I heard that noise. And then I'm going to make my way back and then down where I climbed up. And as I get to the other side, I heard another weird noise. Do you know when you're, you know, when you play back like a, like a cassette tape and you hear those, that real, those real fast sounds there, you know, of the voices, it's, it was, yeah. it, it, it was like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. I yeah. heard when you fast forward. And stuff. Yeah. So I heard that twice, and I thought, that eh, what, what the hell? What? Where did that come from? I turned, took two steps, and when I did, the trees let go on the left side. The right mm. side was pretty much neutral, but then as more of the trees started to go, and I'm going with them. The other side started oh, to come gosh. down. And then I knew I was in big trouble. And as I started to go, I turned and I made sure the hammer was down on the coat python, and I tossed it back towards the front of the pile. And I was along for the ride. Oh, my and gosh. When we came to a stop... I was laying there with uh, covered by trees, not able to get a gasp of air no matter what I did. I was literally crushed. I had no idea. I knew I was hurt, that I was hurt bad, but I didn't know to what extent. And I'm wedged there, and I got this first tree that's coming across my chest and it's so much pressure I I can't even explain what it felt like I got blood pouring out of my right arm out of my right shoulder up near my neck Uh, got a broken foot I got a broken ankle I got a broken hand fractured wrist uh, eight, I believe, eight or nine broken ribs, punctured lung, wow. and uh, buddy, I'm telling you, I knew right then and there, within ten seconds of when everything came to a stop, <clears throat> that I was, uh, I was about done. Uh, I couldn't see no way of them getting that skitter back there, even removing all the trees that they could with the skitter to get down there and get those trees off of me. I couldn't see how they could do it. And between me and you, I, I'd added up two plus two and I didn't have a lot of time. No, not at all. And, and, uh, I remember trying to breathe in, suck air in through my nose. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that I found out I could get a little bit of air. I could get a little bit more air breathing through my nose. So that's what I start doing. And I'm thinking, is there any way I can make a signal? I can't make no sound. I can't yell. Mm-hmm. I, can't, I can't do anything. I'm, I, I mean, I'm, I'm locked in place. 
and uh, then I heard sound down below me. Now, at this point, within three, four minutes, I had literally felt like I had passed out and then came back too. Mm. Mm. Uh, but I found out later on, much later on, after going through hypnosis, I didn't pass out at all. <laughs> but I heard this noise off to the side, the other side, like I had said I had heard in the beginning, those limbs snapping and those sounds. And so I heard more sound. I thought, well, you know what? You know, maybe it's one of the loggers. Maybe it's one of the loggers. And it hit me, no, no, what what would they be doing down there? I mean, uh, as dangerous as this place is, and, you know, the the steepness of the mountain, and that don't make any sense. And I'm laying there, and uh, I prayed because I believe, you know, it's just probably maybe a matter of minutes. I'd be, I'd be pretty much done because uh, my mouth was filling with blood, and uh, so I'm opening my mouth and letting it run out down the side of my face. And that was from the low punctured lung. Uh, but I, like I said, I could still suck some air in through my nose. And I'm going to tell you something. What happened next changed me to this moment right now talking to you on this phone. Mm-hmm. Because I heard something come up from below. And I'm waiting, saying it's got to be a logger. Or there's somebody else out here hiking. And it got closer and made more noise. And then I heard that that sound again. And then I heard it again. And then I heard it a third time. And then I heard more noise below me, and it got louder. And it got a little louder. And uh, there was an opening, this big tree coming across my chest, and then two more on top of it. There was an opening off to my left on like a 45-degree angle. Mm-hmm. And what appeared through that opening? I lost all my bodily functions, and I spit blood about two feet. Mm-hmm. And uh, all I can say is, is that uh, my brain... I guess, was trying to recalibrate to try to make sense while at the same time experiencing fear and terror like I'd never experienced, ever. Mm -hmm. This thing was a monster. I mean, a monster. It had a man's face. But it was huge. It had sunken eyes, high forehead line. It had a scar, a scar that came from its left, above its left eye, down across past his nose and across his mouth. And it was a deep scar. I don't know what happened to it in the past or whatever, but this thing was a monster. And I thought, Oh, I've never experienced anything like this in my life. The closest I can come to it was remembering when my father took us to see the legend of Boggy Creek, you know. Mm-hmm. And and for us back then, that was, you know, that was a big deal. But my whole life being in the woods, all the areas I had traveled to to hunt, trap, camp, fish, never heard a word about them. Never heard a story about them, never thought anything about them because, as far as I know, nothing like it exists. But I'm here to tell you, Chris, they exist. Mm-hmm. This thing was massive. The hands were huge. I could only see it from about the lower chest on up. It had to be three and a half foot, not four foot across. Its head was huge. Mm -hmm. And it's turning, and it leans down, and as it leans down, 
big bubble of drool falls out its lower lip and lands on the tree. And it's looking, turning its head to the right and to the left. And I'm right there three foot away. And I'm gagging because I'm trying to scream and I can't. I, I, uh, I'm laying there and I hear a noise. It sounds kind of like a loud, loud rubbing noise. Something that something's sliding or moving and it's literally dragging a tree down and you could hear the tree sliding on down. It moved a tree. I'm thinking, mm. uh, is, uh, what's this thing doing? What's, and I'm, and I'm literally choking on my blood at this point. Can't breathe. And then uh, I seen the back of it twist and turn towards me again, reach down, and it wrapped its arms around another tree. And it lifted it up. And this tree was about as big around, I'd say, as a basketball, maybe a little bit bigger. And it took it, and it, like pushed it and it slid down, down, down the hill it went. And then that son of a bitch walked up, wrapped its arms around the tree that was pinning me in place, grabbed on it. And when he wrapped his arms around it, about four foot away, I could see its hand where it wrapped its arm around the tree and it picked that son of a bitch up and I am I'm here to tell you that thing had to weigh 800 to 1000 pounds it picks it up and it turns sideways and makes a sound like a grunt sound and as far as I can tell throws it, pushes it and it, when it hit the ground, I could feel the ground shake below me. But another thing happened at that time. I could breathe. I could get some air. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm. I can't. I cannot put in the words. The type of fear you feel. When you experience something like that, I get a kick of a lot of these researchers and shows I watch and yeah. things I watch on YouTube because we're going to go out and we're going to do gifting and we're going to do this and that. The other thing I believe we're so outclassed by these creatures that the month you interact with one in any way, if it wants you, it's got you. You know what I mean? But this thing, this monster, this thing was thinking. This thing was thinking. It was doing. And uh, now, my biggest fear was it was doing what it was doing to get to me. That's what had me petrified. When you lose your bodily functions, mm -hmm. and you're so scared, you're 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 still trying to go. You know what I mean? It's. But after that last tree. It moved about two steps because, again, there's trees down below it. That's what he's walking on. There's trees that had slid down mm -hmm. and made that sound again. And then I yeah. heard it from another distance away, the same noise. Now, a vehicle. I hear a vehicle. And it turns out Two of the loggers were coming down the mountain. When they got to the stack of timber, they seen my backpack. It was laying right there next to the road. There wasn't a lot of places to put it. Mm -hmm. And they stopped. And they stopped. And they got out and yelled, hey, where you at? I heard them yell that. And uh, meanwhile, I'm trying to make a sound. I can't. I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to yell anything. I'm here. Help me. Can't, I can't make no sound. And I don't know what's happening, but what turned what happened was one of the loggers climbed up 
and looked and yelled to the other logger, oh, my God, we got a slide here. These trees let go. And then I find out later on, of course, he had made his way across the pile and got about three quarters of the way to the back, and I heard him yell, oh, my God. And then I heard him, the well, next thing I heard him say was, go, 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 and the truck tears out. Mm-hmm. Um, what in the Sam? And then it hit me. I wonder if he's seen what I seen. Mm-hmm. I wonder. If, I wonder if he's seen what I. Because they, how could they leave me? How could they do that? I'm. I'm telling you, I am messed up bad. Mm-hmm. And that, the truck tears off. But about three, four minutes later, the truck comes racing again. But it sounds like it's going back up where they were because there's there's no place to turn around of course so they had to go down find a place to turn around and then race back up that's what they did and they got the foreman and a total of six of the guys came back down two vehicles with the rifle got up there and hiked back there and uh, basically found me and uh, between them and the volunteer fire department and about 20 other people, including the pilot that flew the helicopter who was helping the loggers, uh, got me to the closest hospital. Basically saved my life. But the gentleman that came up that had climbed up on that stack of timber looking for yeah. me, seen what I've seen. Yeah, it sounds like it. And uh, uh, come to find out after, you know, I I learned afterwards that, you know, he had heard about him being in the area. He had never witnessed one, never seen one. He had heard about him being in the area. And uh, he had told me later that he thought that uh, that, uh, maybe one or two of the other crews had turned down the work, turned down the work because of that, because they had, several incidents in that area in the last several years. Uh, But, uh, you know, when you go through that uh, and you have to live with it your entire life, Uh, I've been through 20 doctors, more, more than 20 medications, I take two medications for PTSD. Uh, when I sleep, I literally pass out. I don't go to sleep because my sleeping disorders are so bad. But two years after the incident happened, it took me about a month to, to tell my father. My father is a rough nap, worked in a factory his whole life, come from a poor background. And I told him what happened. And yeah. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget because I had reservations, great reservations about opening my mouth to anybody. And he sure. walked up and he put, he put his arms around me and said, you know, son, he said, what, like they say, what don't kill you makes you stronger. You know, keep it to yourself. Just, you know, I believe you, but keep it to yourself because I literally, so help me, feared being put in a rubber room. And that's mm. even after even after I had a witness, you know, that yeah. that wit that scene, what was actually there? Well, it, it wasn't the only one. There was three of them. Which it, there was a there was one about five foot tall. There was one about six and a half, seven foot tall. And then apparently that one that lifted the tree, trees moved the trees. Uh, the gentleman said had to be every bit of nine foot tall. Wow! Did you see all the other two then? Well. <laughs> No, I didn't. But oddly enough, Chris, under hypnosis, I did. Recounted okay. the whole story and seen the two standing yeah. side by side. They, you know, because everything was recorded. And yeah. the psychiatrist that I had seen that agreed to do go in and with another, uh, with with three other doctors and put me under hypnosis. After that session, he explained to me he'd have to drop me as a patient. He says, I've never experienced anything like that. I don't even know where to start. He says, I, I can't do it. Yeah. I'm telling you the honest truth. 
uh, if it's the last thing I do, uh, I, you know, if I'm lucky enough, if 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 God's if God sees to it, I'm going to stand in front of one. I'm I'm going to interact with it, mm-hmm. and and, uh, and it's not going to be the way it was on March 8, yeah. 1976. You know what I, I mean? I think that's a good perspective to have because you're kind of confronting it, but in a yeah, but I'm, way that works for you versus being this right because you are vulnerable. Oh you my are God! Trapped and vulnerable, and now you're terrified that this who knows what this thing's going to do. Absolutely, and I'm I'm going to convey to it one way or another. I'm its friend. I'm yeah. its friend. You know, I'm not there to hurt it. I'm not there to hurt its family. You know, uh, you know, I just, it would just, it would mean the world to me, you know, yeah. and, you know, I, you know, I went for 10 years wishing, wishing, you know, my whole life that it, that it's never happened that day and also fight with the idea of, I wish I could stand before the thing that lifted those trees off me and tell it, thank you. But hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, I will see you guys in the morning. We're going to get up early. I'm hoping this mountain gets some good morning light on it. And we're going to get the coffee going up there, and uh, uh, that'll be kind of fun. It's, it's fun to be back outside again, out in nature, and not just in my little studio because it's blizzards and snowstorms for weeks on end. So it's, it's good to be back out here. But we will see you guys in the morning. All right, have a good night. Good morning. I slept really good. The wind finally stopped and I heard the branches brushing against the tent late at night, but it stopped after that. Really interesting. I've been finding hoof prints in the dirt and this morning I heard this sound like walking, this kind of a clomping walking and I couldn't figure out what it was. Obviously it was um, some horses. (laughs) Unzip the tent and at the base of the mountain here was a young horse, possibly a colt, walking along the base of the mountain and then it just kind of ran and so he's on the other side but the horses have been moving around so probably possibly going to see a horse this morning but I'm going to go up here and get some coffee going so let's go do that. Gonna be a nice day today. No wind. After coffee, I'm gonna head up to the Mustang Mountain here and look around. There's some huge boulders up there. Pretty awesome. Today is a double. We got jets flying overhead. Must be heading to Reno or from Reno.
got some bird behind me making some noise. <laughs> He's warning everybody. Really interesting, I got three Mustangs right below the mountain here and they're grazing and they're not too far from where I set my camp. Let's see if you guys can see them. Oh, there's four of them now. One, two, three, four. Yeah, there's four. It might be more. <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah, they're just outside of the trees, so I couldn't see them. But I could clearly hear them this morning. Like I said, I didn't know what they were at first. I was like, what is that? And I was like, oh, it's, it's horses. It's got to be wild mustangs. All right, let's take a look. There's my tent, right down in there. You guys can see that. There is the horses, right there. They're just down there grazing. Yeah, this is why I call this Mustang Mountain. They uh, just gravitate all around the this mountain. Some filming, made videos up here, took pictures. Kind of miss the uh, the wild mustangs up here. And they got their own place up here. Thanks for coming along you guys. That was fun. Heading back now. And I appreciate you guys. Appreciate your comments. And we will see you on the next one as always. Keep hiking.